So I, I did promise a, a serious technical talk, a, and as the title kind of indicates, I'm, I'm a man of my word, but uh, I wanted to start uh, by thanking Avi uh, for his kind of contributions to me, and, and I want to be very, very specific about what I'm thanking him, so I'll take a few minutes for that. Uh, and essentially, if you Google obvious advice, then you get a few natural things. One is, for example, that don't throw a brick straight up in the air. <laughs> Another one is don't iron your clothes while you're wearing them. <laughs> and one more is that if you get a chance of spending some time with Avi, take it. Now, really, I'm, I'm not saying anything new. So about two years before Avi decided to go to the Institute, a local respectable university was recruiting theoreticians based on the renaissance of activity that will happen once he moved to the area, and, and they weren't lying at all. Um, so I want to tell, especially the kind of the youngsters that have the chance of spending some time with Avi, what they can expect to get out of it. So one thing is kind of a stream of knowledge on computer science, on math. And, and for me, I always felt that it's a bit wasted on me. I never felt that I kind of, I can absorb all of this uh, knowledge. So that's wonderful for the smarter people among you. Another thing that you can try to to get is kind of insight about the tools of our trade. And I think that here I, I did a little bit better, because I think there is a fair amount of optimism in my research and a fair amount of lies in my talks. <laughs> so I think there I, I've done a little bit better, but that's not really what I want to thank Avi for. What I really think was invaluable to me and invaluable for many others, is kind of the way he modeled for me what, what does it mean or what could it mean to be a computer scientist. And I think that many, definitely when you get into graduate school, you come with very little understanding of what does it mean to be a, a, a scientist, a mathematician, and whatever you get in kind of popular culture is kind of horrible, horrible images to follow. And so you, what you really need is a good model. And I thought to myself, okay, so, but how can I explain what was this model for me? The kind of thing that came into my mind was a very, very specific image uh, of a rabbi. So there are various ways of, of various kinds of rabbis, but the rabbi that kind of came into my mind is one that doesn't kind of study the, the Torah in, in a room and separately, but rather one where the life and the work are all mixed together in kind of a very joyful kind of celebration. So not doing anything alone, but celebrate your work uh, with your community, with your family, with your students, with your colleagues. And for me, this kind of mixture of life and enjoying life and enjoying work and having all of this within a community is the great thing I, I, I wanted to, to bring here. And yesterday, kind of just to mention, I, I kind of chatted with, with Salil, and he kind of said, oh, I, I wish I had an opportunity to thank Avi in this kind of wonderful celebration. He said, okay, if you had the opportunity, what would you, what would you thank him about? And it all was almost identical to what I just said. And um, so it's not very unique for Salil and me to be kind of coordinated. Uh, so if I have one chance for one story, one of his story is that when he was giving the zigzag uh, talk, he would start with an apology that he's giving the talk because uh, Salil and Omer are having a baby. Uh, <laughs> But to Salil, I think he really enjoyed the fact that, uh, that 
not even being. <laughs> so for me, I enjoy the fact that I don't necessarily have a god, but I do have a rabbi. And Salil, I think, enjoyed yesterday that <laughs> he's not even Jewish, but he still has a rabbi. <laughs> and we enjoyed this fact, and then we went back to our page of Talmud and uh, continued our studies. Okay. So, uh, so then I thought, okay, I would do that, but then what, what should I talk about? But cleverly, a year ago, when I knew that I was going to talk in this event, I asked Avi in a very subtle manner, <laughs> because he does this thing quite a bit, talk in these celebrations. So what do you talk about in this kind of event? So he said, what I talk about is something that I'm excited about and something that uh, the person we're celebrating will be excited about. And that immediately drove me. Okay, so, so this is for us. So apologies to everybody else. I promise that the next talk will be for all of you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is mainly for me and the <laughs> alcohol free and so I thought okay I go, I'm going to talk about this work about a, a constant round uh, proofs that, that have very efficient provers and very efficient verifiers and um, and that's something that Avi should should like because it has many of the things we like interactive proof zero knowledge, succinct uh, uh, NP proof. I should like that. But I was, I was kind of worried because both me and, and the magnificent Rothblums have given a few talks on that, and I know that Avi know this work quite a bit, so I said, okay, I can't bore him, Avi. It's, it's not fair in this celebration. And I said, but you know, there is one part of the talk that we never talk about. And that's we fondly called the zigzag part of this work. I said, okay, let me focus on the zigzag part of, of, uh, of the work. So when we talk about the zigzag construction, we had a paper, uh, Salil and Avi and I, that constructed expander graphs, and it was the zigzag part was a particular way of composing graphs. Uh, so it, it was a, a specific graph product that preserves expansion in some way. But with time, the notion of a zigzag construction, I mean, this was kind of lost in this. If this is not what we mean usually when talking about, or others mean when we talk about a zigzag construction. But instead, we're talking about this kind of an iterative process that, uh, uh, that Odette Goldrach, he, he wrote this beautiful survey, and he, he coined it bravely, moderately. So if you get to want to get to something very wonderful at the end, perhaps start with something much simpler at the beginning, and then in a sequence of steps, uh, go and, and improve it and change it. So the picture is, is misleading because sometimes our beginning is really much more trivial than this <laughs> a creature that is magnificent on its own. Uh, but kind of that, that's kind of what we sometimes mean by um, a zigzag construction. And I said, okay, let me tell you about the zigzag part of that particular construction of, of proof. But then I heard a wonderful talk uh, uh, by uh, Noga Ron Zevi. And she talked about these uh, I rate local codes. And again, she had a very beautiful talk. And at the end, she said, okay, but there, now there is a zigzag part of the proof, but I don't really have the time for it. And I said, okay. So there is a theme here. People don't get to the zigzag part. So first I'll talk about the zig. I'll just focus about the zigzag part of, of many things. And let me kind of try to, to survey very, very briefly the zigzagness of, of some construction. Uh, so when I came and wrote the abstract, I came up with a few papers I want to mention first the construction of expander graph, uh, the proof that uh, the connectivity is under connectivity is in log space. Uh, he reads a uh, beautiful proof of the PCP theorem. And these two last papers that I mentioned, the constant round uh, interactive proof for 
delegated computation, and, uh, and the work that Noga talked about, like Koparski, Mayer, Mayer Swan Zevi, and Sarah. But then after that, by discussions with others, and I was reminded of, of quite a few other papers that can fall into these categories, at least one of them <laughs> I co-authored. <laughs> so, so it was pointed out that to me that kind of an earlier work of a written mind can, can also perhaps be portrayed in this way, uh, uh, a quasi-polynomial combinatorial construction of CCPs, uh, or Meir at uh, the combinatorial construction of locally testable codes, and the uh, combinatorial PCPs with efficient verifiers. And a paper that I wasn't aware of, but really very beautiful, a quasi-polynomial time partition oracle for graphs with an ex excluded minor by uh, Levy and Ron, and I'll mention that uh, soon. So uh, I guess I, I can hear some uh, murmur in the crowd. Can I get some murmur in the crowd? <laughs> yes, I can hear that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, and I, I, I know what you're thinking. Okay, so <laughs> it's very natural. So you're thinking, okay, so is this guy really trying to get credit for every iterative construction in the world? I mean, that's <laughs> horrible, right? W what next? Uh, the wheel, uh, fire. Uh, so, I want to, to reassure you that your criticism first is heard, but it's also not very new. So, actually, uh, King Solomon, in his pseudonym, kind of melancholic pseudonym of Kohelet, said before, that which has, has been is what which will be, and that which has been done is that which will be done, so there is nothing new under the sun. So yeah, so they, we have been criticized before, I understand that, that's fine. But I, I have a few answers to that. So the first answer is that this, the same guy that said that also said utter futility, all is futile. So <laughs> if you, with this approach you can't get very far and <laughs> this is not the guy that you want to bring to a party, so my apologies uh, for that. Another answer that I have is go talk with Odet. Really, go <laughs> talk with Odet. <laughs> and, and he had this survey and he did try to argue that there's something interesting going on. And finally, I want to say that I'm only talking about self-identified work. So many of these works said, okay, in this setting, can we do a zigzag kind of thing? So, so if I try to channel my rabbi, and that's, by the way, it's something very useful about a rabbi, that even if you don't talk with him for years, you can still have kind of mental discussions in your head. So if I try to channel my rabbi, I think he would say, who cares? <laughs> so he'd say, okay, there is something that, that was useful for some people in the past. Let's just discuss it, and perhaps it will be useful for others, and let's, let's do that. Okay. So let me start with... Uh, with this partition oracle uh, uh, work. And say, what do I mean with, with this kind of iterative thing that, kind of, that we call a zigzag construction, or some call a zigzag construction? So what, what's this problem? The, the problem you get um, as input a graph uh, without some fixed minor, so let, let's say without a clique of size phi, and your goal is a local algorithm for partitioning the graph into this small subset of vertices, constant size, with few, relatively few edges going between the different kind of subsets. What do I mean by local algorithm? You don't need to look at the entire graph to know if a particular vertex is, is in, in which group can look at, the, at the, this vertex and somehow something around it and know which group it belongs to. So how do they do that? They start from something simple, right? That's what we said. For the trivial partition of, of the entire graph to individual vertices. So that's great in the sense that the groups are small, but <laughs> they have all of the edges between them, so you didn't do much. So what you do now is combine sets to reduce 
um, to reduce the number of edges going between sets. And that's great, you improve that part, there are less edges, but now the problem is that um, the size has grown. So what you do now, you split sets to reduce the size of the set. Now, I mean, they did a very nice work, but I can do that too. I can <laughs> easily do that. I'll start with the trivial thing. I will combine vertices, and then I'll split them again, and then I'll combine them, and then I'll split them again. So, and each time I'm doing something good for one of the parameters and everything the other parameter. So how does this uh, thing make any progress? And that brings me to one of, uh, I think, I, I want to quote one of perhaps the book that Avi quoted in talks the most, uh, but I'm using a different quote or a different reference from that book. So we have uh, this balancing act. And what it reminded me for many years is this Ned guy, this poor Ned, uh, that has a bed. But the bed is too short. So his legs are outside. But he can do something about it, of course. He can push his legs inside. And he does it. But then his head goes out. So he can <laughs> do something about it and go back. But somehow in this kind of zigzag construction, you do it enough times and somehow, I don't know, the bed grows or you shrink or something good happens. So let's try to see how it, it goes. And here I'll steal one of Noga's uh, uh, slides. <laughs> and, and so that's the zigzag part of her talk. So she said, okay, how does this kind of thing work? How does this balancing of parameters work? You have two parameters. And for example, you may want to minimize S while not decreasing T. Yeah. Whatever direction you want to do, it, it needs to increase. So you have these parameters. You start with the trivial construction with some property. Now you do a zig, which slightly improves S, but slightly destroys T. And then a zag that fixes T, but it almost does no harm to S. So the idea is that you're moving, but, but so you're hurting one parameter, but not as much as you improved it before. And you do it enough times, you get to something interesting. And in their work, the S is the number of queries, and T is the distance of the code. And the trivial construction is, uh, oh, sorry. And in fact, they do something better. Instead of not decreasing T, you can actually improve T in each round. The trivial uh, construction is the identity code. So that's kind of a typical way of how this balancing act goes in these papers. So, and, and then you have these two components that you need to come up with. One uh, for them is a small query reduction. The other one is distance amplification. <coughs> So let's try to see what did we learn about this zigzag construction. We have a slow iterative process from a simple object to the desired result. And then through a careful balancing of parameters, you get what you want. Now I was wondering if I can say something more, something useful uh, about how to try to apply that. And here, I did what I promised in the title. I found that, in fact, we are not very unique. And, and that specific zigzag recipe already exists in, in Jewish uh, uh, scriptures. So the real zigzag kind of recipe is the following. Know where you came from, where you are going, and before whom you are destined to give a judgment and accounting. <laughs> Now, this is from a Pirkei Avot, which translates to chapters or ethics of the fathers. And it, it's really eerie because you can essentially translate it to chapters of the Avid, more or less. So, so yeah, so there's something here. So let me try to, 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 to break it and say, why is it a recipe? What, what about it that is a recipe here? Uh, so let's start with the beginning. So the beginning is pretty kind of you can kind of get it, where you came from and where you're going. And that's exactly what I 
kind of told you, you, you have this thing that you're going to, and the, the thing in the beginning. And the point is that you're allowed some flexibility. You need to be a little bit creative in, in what, in the way you view what you're going to, and in deciding where you're starting from. And that certainly is not something new to any of these works. So my, one example that kind of came very strongly to my mind uh, was, uh, was the heel constructions of pseudorandom generators from one, one way functions. And there you want a pseudorandom generator, but it's very important what you're, what you're starting from. You're starting from a one way function, but you don't want to think about it as a one way function. So you want to think about it as some kind of a generator of some kind of a weak uh, computational entropy. And that's, when you do that, when you realize that, you already done a big part of, of the thing. So let's see in these constructions what, what kind of happened. So first in the construction of van der Graaff, the question is what to start with. What's a simple object to start with? And you can think of several things. What we did is start with a very small expander. So from a small expander, we made it bigger and bigger and bigger until we got uh, this big expander. We could have tried to do something else. In the connectivity algorithm, you start with an arbitrary graph, and one of the things to realize that what you really want is actually an expander. And so, the moment you identify that, you already done a significant part of the job. Now, ignore is a proof of the PCP theorem. So you wanted the end of PCP. Uh, but the most natural thing, and the thing that was tried before, right, and actually here, I mean, the more natural thing is to try, and again, the thing that was tried before is to try, start with an arbitrary graph and try to end up with a very small graph. So once you have a constant size graph, you can definitely do connectivity in it. So what was tried before is to do the graph, make the graph smaller and smaller. So instead, we make it bigger, but an expander. So we derived um, a very natural thing is exactly that. Start with a small PCP, a PCP for a very small circuit, for example, and get a large PCP out of it. But no, that's not what, what she does. She wants to get to a constraint graph with constant gap and start with a constraint graph with very weak gap. The moment you do that, you already done a lot of the, a lot of the work. So, okay, so now you're saying, okay, that was easy. <laughs> but now this guy is stuck with the second part of this uh, strange phrase. And okay, what, what can we do with that? Uh, but no, no, that, that's the essence of it. Because it's important to know what What's going to haunt you? What's the parameter that you need to do accounting of? So which parameter, because there's always some things that you can do in this process which are pretty trivial. You can do that and, and extend things trivially, but then if you do that, then you need to do a non-trivial thing here, or perhaps you need a non-trivial thing here. So very important to identify what's the non-trivial thing you need to do. And in the original paper, it was the zigzag uh, graph. That was the, we did a lot of trivial transformations. You can raise the graph to some power. You, you, can, cont you can tensor product a graph. But you needed something non-trivial, which was a way to reduce the degree of, of uh, a graph without harming its expansion. And each one of these things, essentially, at some point, you have something that haunts you. So now I can go back to what I, I wanted to start with, and that's the um, <coughs> and that's the this interactive proof for delegation. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about what are these these proofs. Um, so interactive proof, many of us know, we have a prover, we have a verifier, the prover wants to prove something, 
for example, in the, uh, the case of IP equals P space, where P wants to prove uh, something that P space is complete, like I have a strategy to play chess or something very powerful. And the verifier is, is much weaker. And through rounds of interactions, the prover uh, convinces the verifier. But what was observed uh, before this work is that for many kind of real life uh, applications or cases where you need this kind of, of, uh, of proof, for example, when you're delegating work uh, from a particular uh, small de device to the cloud, you can't expect the cloud to be exponential time. Uh, and, uh, and what you really want is something where the prover is still polynomial time, is still efficient, and the verifier is, is extremely efficient, let's say linear time uh, or even less than that. So what we do is find this kind of proof with several properties. So first, the prover is very efficient, it's polynomial time, the verifier is linear or in some setting of the parameters even sublinear, and there are a constant number of rounds of the proof. And what kind of languages can we prove here? We can prove languages, so I, I prove the output of a computation, so here is the computation um, tableau, where the space is kind of subpolynomial, n to the delta for some delta, and the time is polynomial, because if I want the prover to be polynomial time, I definitely can't expect them to prove something that's more than polynomial time computation. So I want to prove the output of this kind of a computation. And now we actually ask ourselves, okay, can we zigzag this kind of issue? And we said, okay, what's the simple thing that you can, you can start with? The simple thing that you can start with is um, proving much shorter computations. For example, if you want to, uh, to prove computations that are done in a constant number of steps, then this is very easy to come up with. So the verifier can do the computation on their own. They can just do a few, a few steps. So let's say you created a few of these, uh, a few of these um, small computations. So for small computation, you do have an interactive proof. And now um, you want to combine them. And that's where we were stuck for a very, very long time. Because now you have several small computations that you want to verify. And there are two things you can try to do. One is to check a few of these computations at random. I'm only going to verify this one. But perhaps there is only one computation that is wrong. And then you won't catch it with very high probability. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing you can do is verify everything. But then you really didn't do anything interesting and all of your resources are growing. Um, so we were really kind of obsessing about this kind of uh, amortization. And, and we didn't, we weren't able to do it because we weren't thinking about the right uh, the right object. We didn't know where we were headed to. And, and where we were headed to uh, was this kind of creatures. Um, that the other part, which we gave many, many, many times, kind of explain why are these uh, interesting uh, things. And these are um, interactive variants of some non-interactive objects. So what we wanted, we wanted any proof, but it essentially we, we needed to prove something with some additional properties. So what are the properties we need? We need uniqueness. We need the prover to be forced to prove in one particular way. So even if the prover tries to prove something that's correct, but deviates from the protocol, it will fail. And that's kind of an analog of UP. Uh, so th the, uh, the NP version where either you don't have 
any, any um, witness or a single witness. And the other thing that's even more important is this local chaffing, which is a variant of TCP. So we wanted an interactive proof such that the verifier, verifier gets the entire communication but doesn't really need to read the entire communication. But just like in a TCP, you need to spot check a few of the bits of this computation. And we needed the, actually a version that combines both. And I want to, to point out that this notion was independently introduced and with a different name. Uh, so we call it uh, PCIPs, but it was called Interactive Oracle Proof by uh, Ben Sasson et al. with really independent kind of uh, uh, motivation and, and various kind of interesting results. And the moment we have that, everything kind of try, starts to work out because now, now we do have the two parameters that we can optimize. Before setting up the right kind of object, we, we couldn't trade off anything. And now we do have, so we have the size of the proof and we have the query complexity. So now we can do amortization, which is again the non-trivial part of the, the proof, and then we can do query reduction. Now we get our zigzag part of, of that one. So, uh, so happy birthday. Yeah, the, 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 this uh, association of the zigzag, I don't think we, I don't remember us having, thinking about that as the zigzag. No, the zigzag was a, a, a graph product that had three parts. One was a zig and one was the zag and uh, we had this. And uh, yeah, in, in, yeah. Right. Just based on the construction and the we had all of these nice graphics where you, you can see the Z in the, this graph product. And yeah. <laughs> yes, so the, the question was, is there a way to, to a way to understand when, when this recipe is going to work and when it's not? And uh, and the answer is, is clear, because at, at least for anybody that attended any of the previous talks in this celebration of Avi, the answer is yes, it, it is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's how you do it, right? <laughs> Research by optimism. <laughs> that, that because that's because I mentioned my uh, capacity. <laughs> hey, it's unfair that you're not uh, giving a talk. Always. Mm. 
Yeah, I, so I think that's what uh, Dave is going to answer in his talk. <laughs> I just don't want to, yeah. Yeah. 